You're listening to the My Wife Quit Her Job podcast, episode number two. But before we begin, I just wanted to give a quick thank you shout out to my buddy Jeff Rose, who blogs at goodfinancialsense.com and dollarsandroses.com. Now, Jeff was actually one of the people who inspired me to start this podcast, and for that, I am very thankful. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the My Wife Quit Her Job podcast, where we'll teach you how to create a business that suits your lifestyle so you can spend more time with your family and focus on doing the things that you love. Here's your host, Steve Chu. Welcome to the My Wife Quitter Job podcast. Today, I am honored to have Andrew Udarian with me on the podcast. Now, Andrew is actually someone who I came across randomly one day on the internet. And at the time, he had just started his blog, ecommercefuel.com. And I was just so impressed with his content that I actually decided to reach out and say hi to him directly. And I'm so glad that I did because since then, he has become a well-known figure in the world of small business e-commerce. He runs two drop-shipped online stores at rightchannelradios.com and trollingmotors.net. Actually, he just sold one of those recently, and it was actually very interesting how he did that. You should go on his blog and check that out. But he also runs an e-commerce forum that is heavily populated with successful e-commerce entrepreneurs as well. Andrew is a great guy, extremely intelligent, and I'm happy to call him a friend. Welcome to the show, Andrew. How are you doing today? I'm good, Steve. Thanks for the kind intro. It's uh, looking forward to talking. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, for all those who, who aren't familiar with all the different sites that you run, can you give us a quick background story and tell us, uh, mainly, I guess, focusing on your baby, which is rightchannelradios.com? Sure. So just in terms of uh, what I do, or do you want the backstory as well? Yeah. Let's let's start with the backstory and then, you know, transition to, you know, what you've done and uh, what you actually sell on that site. Sure. So I guess my story is I got to... Uh, Getting on with college, went into a job in finance for for a couple of years and learned a lot. I met some great people, but it was just, um, you know, it was not what I envisioned myself doing for the next 10 or 20 years, especially given the work-life balance that was, was you know, there or not there, rather, I guess. And so I just ended up saving a bunch of money or doing my best to uh, and quit. So I had a little bit of time to explore my options and looked at a bunch of different things and finally settled on e-commerce as, as a business model that, you know, could scale really well, was location independent. Um, that at least in terms of how I got started with drop shipping didn't require a tremendous amount of capital and just kind of did some research and stumbled up across the uh, the radio niche the CB radio niche um, as, as you know something potentially that uh, that might work out and so I spent I guess that was in 2008 spent the next uh, two or three years really just building up that site bootstrapping that site um, and after a year it was uh, you know helping me make right about a full-time income uh, and uh, I guess two or three years in, starting trollingmotors.net with the same kind of idea, dropshipping site, wanted to just get a little, little more experience, diversify my, my income. And, um, and a couple of years after that, started e-commerce fuel, which you mentioned, which you know, I, I do a lot, a lot of the stuff that, uh, um, you know, that you do, Steve, uh, when I was getting ready to start. Uh, you know, you were one of the few people that was really producing really interesting, compelling e-commerce content and um, wanted to do something along those same lines. And so uh, that's kind of where I am now, running the uh, Right Channel Radios, sold trollingmotors.net recently, and then also, like you mentioned, just have the, the e-commerce fuel form for, for uh, existing store owners and e-commerce professionals. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for the, the kind words, by the way. Um, I was just curious, so if you know, if, if you can take us back to when you first started uh, thinking about selling CB radios, how did you kind of come up with the idea? How did you research that niche and decide that you wanted to go into it? It was, you know, it, it's really tough because that was, that was what, 2008. And so here we are in 2014. And, and I've learned a ton over the last six years as you do is, you know, diving in, getting your hands dirty. And sometimes you wonder how much you project back onto your past self and how much is actually, you know, you thought about in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but the high level process that I took was, was really, for me, building a profitable business was most important. And I didn't necessarily need to be selling something that I was deeply passionate about. Uh, I like the business process. And so I really took a top-down analysis, top-down approach, and just looked for uh, some of the things I was looking for. I was looking for um, a decent amount of uh, you know, keyword traffic, enough to be able to support a business, but not so enormous that there were going to be a lot of the huge stores really specializing uh, in, in that niche. That was one thing I looked for. I looked for uh, an area where I could add value. Okay. So some kind of product where there was really a lot of confusion 
a lot of uh, potential uh, pre-purchase uh, anxiety about, wow, shoot, if I'm going to buy this, is this going to work with my application? Uh, the radios I sell go on a whole, you know, myriad of different number of vehicles and there's different installation options. And so um, there's room to add a lot of value there. Looked for something where there were decent suppliers I could work with. Uh, and so I looked at just a number of criteria. I looked for something that wasn't available locally. Uh, there's, there's, you know, probably a checklist of maybe 10 different things that I had. Uh, and then I just went out and started brainstorming everything, you know, every idea under the sun. I probably had a list of 50 or 60 totally random ideas. Um, everything you could imagine, lots of ridiculous stuff in there too. And then I just started going through and, and after I had that initial, uh, kind of freeform brainstorming session, just went through and started evaluating those ideas at a high level against my criteria. And when I got down to, you know, two or three or four, I really did a deep dive in terms of looking at competitors, looking at, um, you know, trying to get an idea of margins, uh, you know, trying to get a sense for, for the marketplace and, um, and then ultimately ended, uh, you know, picking CB radios to move forward with. So. So was uh, was CB radio something that you actually knew a whole lot about? Because you mentioned you wanted to pick a niche where you could add a lot of value to. I knew nothing. I had never used one. <laughs> <laughs> that's <laughs> and amazing. I, okay. And I think for the first year that I was in business, I don't even think I saw a CB. No, that's not true. I, I ordered one to install on my vehicle so I could get a sense for, you know, how to install them and get some kind of tactile and, and, and physical in-person sense for the product. But uh -huh. 95% of the products I sold that first year, I had never even seen in person. Wow. Okay. So you really took a, a a business approach uh, in deciding what you wanted to sell. So is that something that you recommend in general versus going after something that you're passionate about? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think it depends on, uh, I think it depends on you as a person uh, or at least the entrepreneur uh, in question, whether or not, you know, how you're built. Um, if you love business for the sake of business and you love hustle for the sake of hustle, uh, I think you can go out and sell just about anything. It doesn't matter if it's something you're interested in. But if if you don't really necessarily have an innate desire and love of, of business in and of itself, um, I think that's going to be a lot harder. It's a lot harder to sell something that you have no interest in. And I think at that point, if you do want to build a successful business, you do need to, to be selling and, and, and offering something that you are passionate about. Because you got you got to have that passion come from one of those two places. And if it doesn't come from one of those two, either love of business or love of the product, you're going to be in trouble. And so that's kind of, I think that's a kind of an internal discussion that people have to have with themselves and be really honest about. Yeah, I, I agree. Cause coming from a, you know, our store, we sell handkerchiefs and I'm, I'm certainly not into handkerchiefs, <laughs> <laughs> but I am very into the business and running, you know, the data, you know, running and planning the marketing strategy and that sort of thing. So I can kind of see where you're coming from. Um, Let's talk about the business model a little bit. Uh, why did you choose drop shipping as opposed to a traditional route, which is carrying inventory and that sort of thing? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think uh, like most people with drop shipping, I was uh, attracted to the convenience of it. Um, you know, of course, with, when you drop ship, you you don't have physical inventory. You're working with other suppliers. They take care of all the ordering of the stocking of the shipping. All the fulfillment and inventory side is outsourced. And it's... Uh, you know, that was really attractive to me. And it's also low risk when you're starting out. It can be a great, we can't do it for all markets, but in some markets, it's a great way to test the viability of the market without having to go out and order a bunch of stuff. So for me, it was really the location independence of it. And, um, you know, I'm really glad that, especially for the first couple of years, I was really glad I did go the drop shipping route. I think as, as you're starting, it can be a great way to learn, um, especially without having to risk a ton of capital. Uh, I was able to to leverage the the location independence of it and was able to do some some cool stuff um, without being tied down to a warehouse in terms of being able to do a little bit of travel during that time and have flexibility. But I think I've said this before on my podcast too, starting from scratch now uh, with my experience uh, and and if somebody has a little bit more savvy in the e-commerce world and and maybe some money to invest, your long term returns, uh, as you know, Steve, you know, in terms of making your own product or stocking your own product, are going to be significantly higher if, uh, you know, as opposed to drop shipping. So it's a mixed bag. I'm glad I did it, but it definitely, you know, drop shipping is not like this, uh, you know, necessarily the, the the land of magic and unicorns and and and, <laughs> e and easy profits that I think a lot of people maybe, you know, uh, <laughs> think yeah, that nothing, it is. nothing ever is. I was just curious though, how much did you invest uh, starting your drop ship store? I think all in fifteen hundred bucks. That's okay. Total. That's really inexpensive. Yeah, it wasn't much, and it was it was all bootstrapped from there. I think like the end. Of, I mean, obviously, I, I rolled profits from the company back in, but the only capital infusion I think uh, was was fifteen hundred. 
Okay. Yeah, that's nothing. I mean, for us, I think we we invested 630, but I also did all the website development myself. I, I imagine you got you got help in that department. No, I did it myself. Oh, you did it yourself also? Okay. Which was very evident by how the website looked. But um, It looks great. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. This is version 2 or 3 or 4.0. <laughs> the first version looked uh, <laughs> looked like you know the wet 1990s web just vomited on, on a web page in 2008. So. <laughs> so I thought you could comment on this. One trend, at least, so since I run a class and I have students who are interested in dropshipping, one of the trends that I've been noticing actually is a lot of these vendors want you to actually have a brick and mortar store in order for them to be willing to drop ship for you as well. So can you comment on how to get around that or if you've ever uh, you know, encountered something like that? Yeah, no, that happens a lot um, and it, it's tough. Uh, I know I, I was chatting with Billy Murphy, of course, he's a friend of both of ours and um, you know, he, I think he got around that one time by, by partnering with a local shop uh, who was selling the same goods. And I think he pretty much went to them and said, hey, here's my situation. I want to sell this product, and the only way I can do it is open up a brick-and-mortar store. So I can either, A, open up a store in town and compete with you here, or we can partner up and you can be, you know, you can be my, uh, I guess, just my partner on paper if for nothing else so that I can ink this agreement with the manufacturer uh, to be able to uh, to be able to sell the product. And so I think that's what he did and it worked out for him, which was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one way you can also, of course, I think a lot of people sometimes will, well, they'll buy just a real small office space or sometimes even like a, uh, a storage, uh, you know, a storage container at a, at a, at a uh, uh, what are they? Oh, those. What do they call the storage? Yeah, yeah, the self storage place. Yeah, thank more you. Of this, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank you, self storage. But it's it's tough, you know. It's uh, you, unfortunately, you either got to build something or be a little sneaky in how you do it, and it's not always necessarily guaranteed to to work. So it's tough. It's not always something you can get around. Okay, so uh, you know you, you've done uh, drop shipping, and you do carry a little bit of your own inventory. Is that right today, or yeah, a little bit, not a ton, but I mean maybe there's maybe three or four items that we carry. That uh, that our suppliers don't have, and we simply we have a good enough working relationship with our suppliers where we buy it from the manufacturer. We ship it to our our drop shipping suppliers, and they just okay. kind of keep it in a corner for us and act as our fulfillment house, and we'll throw it in with orders as as the orders come in. Oh, okay, that's pretty clever. So, do you have multiple? Do you just work with one one or uh, one or two vendors, or do you have a whole bunch that you work with? We definitely have more than one. Um, okay, yeah, it's I think. Anytime you set up your business, especially a, especially if you're drop shipping and you rely on one source for that, that's uh, it's a pretty dangerous place to be, both in terms of availability and, and in terms of pricing too. So, okay, I'm just curious how you have things set up. Also, uh, so if someone places an order on your site, does that order just go straight to the vendor? And do you have uh, tracking information about the inventory and that sort of thing? We don't. This is this is something where. It's almost embarrassing to talk about, and but we're really old school in the way we do things. It's I've been wanting to write a post about how a lot of stuff in business just you think like you look at the surface and it looks all smooth and operating you know flawlessly, and and you think people have everything together, and then you actually dive into the systems, and a lot of times stuff is just duct tape together and really ghetto and <laughs> just oh yeah i mean done. we have a lot of ghetto stuff too so i mean we can have confessions if you want but all oh, us do it yeah <laughs> you'll make me feel better i'll, I'll share some other stuff and so one thing that is on my list to do this year is to set up a little more real-time inventory tracking and order routing and we had that with with our trolling motor site before we sold it but for right channel we just you know we have a staff member who as orders come in she goes she will route them based on product availability and then also based on location so you know we have you know multiple suppliers and usually we try to route that to the supplier that's closest to the customer to save on shipping and also to save on uh, and also to save on uh, um uh, I guess to to expedite the delivery to that person. So right now we don't have a whole lot of overlap. A lot of that is done manually, but we're looking at at bringing something in like Ordoro or you dropship from Magento this year to automate a lot of that because it's it's pretty embarrassing that we are still doing a lot of that manually. You know, I I don't think it's all that embarrassing, and you know I think a, a big mistake that a lot of people do is they spend a whole lot of money on this stuff up front when they don't have any business. So it's just a gradual transition, right? Once it gets to a point where you need to automate it, you just go ahead and automate it. At least that's my opinion. Yeah, no, it's a good point. It's I think that's, I'd, if I had to be in one of the two categories, it'd be definitely the, the latter, you know, doing it manually for a while. Because it's, it's true, I think there is a temptation to, to create a perfect system for, for something that doesn't yet exist. 
Yeah, definitely. So, you know, you've done a little bit of both. So, you know, you, you're in a pretty unique position to kind of understand the challenges associated with dropshipping and carrying inventory. So what are some of the challenges that you faced with dropshipping? With dropshipping, it's, man, where do I begin with the, the challenges? Um, I think margins are probably the biggest one. Uh, you've got, you know, it, it, it's going to vary, but your margins for drop shipping are anywhere from 10 to 30 percent, uh, which, you know, 30 percent is on the high side for drop shipping. For example, our trolling motor site, the margins were about 11, 12 percent. A little bit easier in that market with lower margins because we had a very high uh, per order price, which helped right. offset that, that a bit, but still pretty low. Um, and so w- one thing, the hardest thing is I think it's difficult to scale with paid traffic. If you're going to run a drop shipping site, it's hard to make that work. Uh, it's hard to pay for customers and advertise to grow your business. Um, mm-hmm. Just because, you know, I think AdWord, a lot of AdWord stuff, I mean, 20, 25% is about the margin area where a lot of times, it's going to vary by niche, but roughly where it really makes sense to start paying for, for customers unless you have a really high lifetime value, right? Unless you want to lose lose some money on that first sale or two and you'll make it up over repeat purchases in the life of the customer. Um, so you've really got to be good at, at hustling, at organic marketing, at SEO, uh, at, at building traffic and attention in other ways. And that takes a while to do. Um, another issue is there's, there, anytime you put an intermediary between you and your customer, it's going to cause problems. You know, we have one of the I think one of the things that I think is most frustrating in life in general is having to own up and accept responsibility for someone else's mistake. And we have to do that on a weekly basis a lot of times uh, when a customer gets something that, that uh, an item was missing or it got shipped to Canada versus you know Texas. Mm. Um, and it's tough because you, you can't say, "Hey, I'm sorry, I was our drop shipper. It's not our fault. It's highly unprofessional, right? And, yeah, absolutely. you know, and so you just have to own up to it. You've got to make it right. And, uh, you know, that's another thing that uh, is tough. And then also the shipping experience. I mean, you can, you've got someone else who's managing your shipping. And so you can't necessarily control standards quite like you'd like to. Um, you don't have, we don't at least work with our, our own shipping accounts. So if an item goes out and we need to return it, uh, we need to issue an intercept, we need to issue a, like a, a call tag to bring something back. We really don't have our own UPS account. We have to go through our supplier, and then our supplier has to take care of things and communicate back to us, and then we have to wait for them, and then we talk to the customer. And so there's a lag time on everything. And so those those are some of the the frustrations uh, in terms of drop shipping, at least that, that we've run into. So 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 that it kind of implies that your your partner or your vendor is is a very integral part of your business, and it's essential that you guys have a really good relationship. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and it's it's tough, you know, because we've it's it's <laughs> it can be a fine line because you want to maintain a good working relationship, a good rapport. But sometimes, and and we do, we have a great relationship with our suppliers. But you also have to be able to hop on the phone occasionally and bust some chops when stuff is is slipping. And um, you know that it's it, you got to be able to do that in a way. You got to know when to do that uh, in a way to make sure things are continuing to be be taken care of appropriately in a high quality manner. And you also have to know when to give a little bit of grace and a little bit of understanding when there's just stuff. I mean, any business is going to have mistakes. And so you sure. got to gotta know where that threshold is. It's kind of like management, right? Uh-huh. Um, you know, you want to you wanna be, if, if you have people under you and you're a leader, you want to be, hold people accountable, uh, but you don't want to be, you know, just a hammerhead. Uh, you know, you, you want to be someone who they look up to and can come to with questions, but you don't want to be a pushover too. So it's a fine line to walk. Yeah, it's almost like having your own employees in a way, except that you have no direct control over. <laughs> yeah, it is a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's a good way to look at it. So if you, uh, so whenever you get returns, do they come back to you or do they go back to the manufacturer? Well, it's it's funny you ask that. They usually will go back to the manufacturer, but okay. sometimes they'll come back to us based on just I think USPS makes it harder to put our return or put the uh, the supplier's return address. Uh, on the packages as opposed to the warehouse. And so if they get returned, they'll come back to to uh, to actually my office. Um, or sometimes people will just, you know, uh, I guess there's there's it's kind of confusing because sometimes the, the UPS label will get scanned. And even though it says our supplier on the return address, mm-hmm. the address on the label will say our office. And, and so I've got, you know, right now I've probably got three or four radios and six antennas in my, you know, in my office that, uh, that just happened to come back to me. So it's most of them go back to the supplier, but, uh, definitely get some, some stragglers coming back to me. Just to share a story, we got return merchandise sitting in our office too. That's been unprocessed. So, uh, you know, you're not alone there, Andrew. <laughs> that's good to hear. And, and, and it's tough cause it's, 
man, sometimes you look at stuff and you just get caught up and, and usually we're pretty good about getting, getting, you know, following up with people and figuring out what happened. But every, you know, sometimes stuff just occasionally falls through the cracks and, and man, there's something, I mean, there's something right now in my, in my, in my office that I'm like, oh man, I've got it. I got to figure out where this came from. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. So, you know, an earlier point that you just made about, um, not having the margins uh, for pay-per-click traffic. So how do you get the customers uh, onto your site if you're not paying for it? Yeah, good question. You know, back in when I was building the Bright Channel, it was just a lot of it was good old-fashioned networking in the niche, a lot of guest posting, a lot of uh, really pitching people on, um, on, on quality articles and buyer's guides uh, that we would put together for their audience. And so we would go out to... We would try to identify, okay, who are our customers that were vehicle owners? Where do those vehicle owners hang out? Well, there's a lot of communities for different vehicles of all different types, of course, online. And then we would try to go identify, uh, you know, the owners of those communities and try to build a a relationship with them uh, first and then try to network with them and then offer them something of value to their visitors and really pitch it as not, hey, can we guest post on your site? Uh, But more of, hey, we noticed that there's this this gap in in the articles that you offer or the resources that you offer to your to your visitors. Uh, not sure if it'd be interesting, but if you would like kind of a comprehensive buyer's guide on picking, you know, radio equipment for, for let's say, a Corvette, for example, uh, mm-hmm. we'd love to write it for you. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that would work, sometimes it wouldn't. But that's how we, we were able to, to get a lot of the, at least the backlinks, a lot of the, uh, the traffic and, and the relationships. I think it's really it's about building relationships. If you can build genuine relationships with people in your niche and with people that serve your end customers, mm-hmm. uh, you know, eventually that's going to lead to something. As long as you have something genuinely of value to offer, that's going to lead to that exchange. Uh, I think it's when people lead right out of the gates with with emails that are just hard sales right out right up front that people get turned off. And so that was the approach we took for for marketing uh, I, you know right channel radios into a lesser extent trolling motors. Okay, so you were guest posting on just related blogs or and making partnerships with people in your same niche and then that just gradually built up your search engine traffic. Yep. That, yeah. Okay. Exactly. And blogs and probably blogs somewhat, but then also probably even more communities and forums and a lot of like forums out there for, for hobbyists or enthusiasts will have a form section. And a lot of times they have like an article and a resource section. And we, we love those. Okay. Okay. So I'm just, you know, since we're on the topic of SEO, uh, Google has been making a lot of changes these past couple of years. And I was just wondering if your strategy has changed at all uh, as a result of that. Yeah, it's a good, it's a great question. And it has, and to be honest, I haven't, I haven't, it's been, you know, oh, it's probably been three or four years since I launched a brand new e-commerce store. Mm-hmm. But with, at least with the e-commerce fuel, um, you know, the kind of the content community site, that's been about, you know, a little less than two years I've been running that. And, and for that, the approach has differed significantly. I mean, uh, you know, take the, the old SEO we used to do for right channel radios, we would focus a lot on anchor text. We would focus a lot uh, on, on really, Keyword research still is important, but we were really anal about it. You know, making sure the exact phrase was was perfect for what the uh, the search volume was, and uh, and guest posting. We were probably focused more on quantity versus quality. You know, mm-hmm. fast forward to what the 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 strategies I've been trying to use with with e-commerce fuel, and it's it's been much more focused on getting a, a lower number of high quality links. It's been much more focused on trying to write along, a, a, create a lot of quality in-depth long form content uh, and, and build a reputation, uh, drive people to, to really engage with that content in terms of comments and, and shares. Um, it's been about building relationships with a lot of the high profile key players in the space. Um, and, and really it's been, it hasn't, been focused as much on you know anchor text or exact keywords. I'll still look for, you know, when when I'm writing a blog post, for example, on e-commerce fuel, I'll still a lot of times try to come up with you know a keyword that I think is a keyword or keyword phrase that I know people are searching for. But once I have that, like for example, I'm getting ready to publish a post on on bootstrapping, and so I did a quick search in Google Auto Suggest for bootstrapping in business, and mm-hmm. came up with I think uh, bootstrapping my business was the phrase people searched for, and so you know I'll go ahead and make sure that's the URL for my blog post. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll make sure I get that phrase at least once into the copy. Uh, I may or may not include that phrase in the title exactly based on how compelling it fits in with a really strong title, and mm-hmm. that's it. 
You know, I'm not going to go out and try to build links with it back with that anchor text. I'm not going to make sure it occurs five times in the copy because Google is getting, I think, much better at deciphering intent at, at really being able to distinguish high quality stuff versus versus lower quality stuff. And for me, it's been more about building a, ver- a highly authoritative site and mm-hmm. letting the site authority and the domain authority really help propel the rankings for individual articles as opposed to trying to, to game the system. Uh, right. So. Right. And that's and that's on your blog that you were talking about, right? Do you still do posts for right channel radios or we you know, we it it's been we haven't done a marketing push for for right channel in a while. And I don't know about you, Steve, but I tend to be very like silo focused. Like I will spend six months focusing on like promotion for e-commerce fuel and then I'll spend six months on uh, you know or three months focused on like selling one of my businesses and then I'll spend you know four months focused on on really gearing up and improving the processes for like right channel and so it's been a little while since we've done a marketing push for right channel and so a lot of the growth that we've seen there has been um, more based on word of mouth and organic referrals, I think, okay. uh, um, for the business. So it's we. To be honest with you, we haven't done a lot of guest posts. Yeah, you know, uh, I'm the same way as you. I can't really focus on multiple things at once. So I I tend to just do one thing, and when that's done, I move on to the next. So yeah, exactly. I, I feel like it's so much more efficient than trying to juggle four big projects at once. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So it, it sounds like a lot of your traffic to your store is SEO and. At least with my store, SEO traffic didn't kick in till much later in the first year. So how did you get sales early on and how did you prevent yourself from getting discouraged uh, yeah, in the beginning? Yeah, that's a great question. I'm a big advocate of even if even if it's not necessarily profitable uh, early on with a store to run some paid traffic to it. And so I'd say for the first six months, we ran paid traffic uh, with, with Google AdWords primarily to right channel. Uh, just for those two reasons, one to to not get discouraged <laughs> because man, even there's a lot there's an emotional aspect to you know to seeing those sales come in. Even if you know you're not necessarily making a whole lot of money or any money on them, uh, it's I, it it gives you a motivational factor. But even more importantly, it helps you start engaging with customers understand who they are, what they want, what kind of problems they're having, uh, what kind of products that they need that you don't offer. Because uh, mm-hmm. obviously, you know, it's you, you learn so much engaging directly with customers. And so we kind of would start with that. And then as the search engine uh, traffic picked up and started to really become the lion's share of the traffic, then we kind of discontinued or slowly uh, trailed off on with the paid traffic. But it was very useful starting out. Yeah. So what were some of the tools that you used to analyze your, your customers uh, was this just from talking with them on the phone, or? Yeah, I'd say the best tool is getting people on the phone. Um, okay. You know, it's it's funny because I, I think we probably we could probably have a whole podcast about this too, Steve, in terms of uh, whether or not you should have a phone number. And we, you know, right now with Right Channel, like we do a lot of things to try to, uh, to try to really stand out with customers, but we don't necessarily offer. <clears throat> excuse me, we don't necessarily offer like a phone number people can just call up and talk anymore, uh, and. You know, it's can okay, we could talk about the, the the pros and cons of that. But early on, it's it's so valuable. You get someone on the phone, you talk directly with them back and forth, and and you learn so much about who they are, what they need, uh, where your shortcomings as, as a business are. Uh, uh-huh. Just being on the phone, as you know, then I I think it's the best tool you can use to to get market intelligence from your customers. Yeah, you know, I I think it really depends on the niche because in ours, which is the wedding industry, you absolutely have to have a phone number because you have all these frantic people calling you up with (laughs) deadlines. So (laughs) it's really funny. Yeah, that makes and it's funny. Like the same thing with the trolling motors. With trolling motors, you know, people are looking at buying a fifteen hundred dollar trolling motor. Um, If they can't, everyone may not need to call or want to call, but if they feel like they can't call. That's a big deal. You know, I would not want to order a $1,500 trolling motor from someplace who didn't at least post a phone number or that I could get a, get a live person on the phone from. So it, I think it is, it is market specific. Yeah, absolutely. So let's change, let's switch gears a little bit. And, uh, you know, at least on my mind, and this was kind of spurred by one of the topics on your forums, on the e-commerce fuel forums, and this is just the whole topic of Amazon and how Amazon is kind of commoditizing uh, a lot of the online stores. So what do you see happening and what are you doing with your store to kind of fight against Amazon? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's man, Amazon is just eating up retail. And it'd be nice to be able to hate on them, but they're, you know, they do a really good job in terms of customer service, in terms of offering the best combination, I think, of, uh, for a lot of products, value and convenience. Um, and so 
you know, what I see happening is I really see, I see kind of a hollowing out of the middle of the market. If you're a big store that sells a lot of, you know, it's fairly broad based uh, and sells a lot of existing products, existing products on the market. Um, I think I think sites like that are going to have a real hard time the next couple of years. Places like I don't know why Tiger Direct always comes to mind, but I feel like <laughs> they're kind of just a general retailer, a reseller of kind of general electronic parts, and and I don't see how they're going to survive in the next two to three to four years. Um, and so, so what I see happening is you either have you know, you either need to do one of Amazon's going to be the place that if you're looking for something and price is very important to you, uh, an existing product, people are going to go there largely. And really as, as independent retailers, you either need to offer one of three things. You either need to offer a unique product that you can't get anywhere else. So you control the distribution. An example is, uh, the guys over did you see the Kickstarter campaign for Manal, the Manal travel bag? I did not. Awesome. I'll, I'll have to link, uh, maybe you can put it in the show notes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy and Doug over there, the great, great guys, and they put together an incredible travel bag that solves a lot of problems that lightweight travelers on the road have. I bought one of them, and it's it's amazing. They've got something that's nowhere else on the market, and it's uh, you know they control complete distribution, so they can they can set uh, whatever price they want. They can control that that uh, supply chain, and so they're not getting undercut. So I think you know that's one option: having your own product. Uh, the other option is having a very strong branded experience. Uh, so if you're going to sell existing products, do something really unique, really, uh, you know, something where that somehow the experience is tied into the product. Um, that's another option. Or the third one is is add value, uh, add informational value to existing products. And that's what I try to do over at Right Channel Radios is um, really add a lot of value up front to Amazon can't in terms of what goes with what, really specializing in a very niche field uh, and adding value in a way that one thing we're doing, you know, you asked, so what we're trying to do to differentiate ourselves. Uh, one thing we're doing this year is really going in and creating in-depth installation guides for vehicle, for specific vehicles. So let's say you've got, uh, let's say you've got a Chevy 2010 half ton pickup truck. Um, not only can you come to our site, you know, hopefully in six months and, or three months even to be able to understand what products are all going to go together. But we're going to have a, a 10-page illustrated installation guide on exactly how to install that product on your specific vehicle. Mm-hmm. And that's something where it's going to cost a decent amount of money to produce up front. But once we do, that's got $10, $20, $30, $50 worth of value. I mean, it's hard to say, but definitely has a lot of value to somebody who doesn't know how to install it. And it's something as once you create, it's, it's like an information product that is added to your e-commerce mix. Um, that's one thing we're going to try to do. We're also really looking to personalize our site a lot more. Um, you know, just this week, we're actually going to go film a an about us video for myself and my sales manager. We're going to get in front of the camera. We're going to talk about who we are as people, like who you know, how we can help uh, our, our customers really put a, a face to the brand uh, it, because that's another thing that just is going to differentiate small merchants from you know big giants like Amazon is being personal. People love to buy from people and I think that's going to be increasingly important. So anyway, sorry, Steve, I kind of rambled on there for a while. No, no, it was all good stuff and I actually had a couple comments on that. So when I shop at Amazon and if I was buying something complicated like a radio that I needed to mount on my pickup truck, for example, the support just isn't there. Sure, they have an excellent return policy, but once I've purchased the product, uh, I can't exactly go and ask Amazon how to install it and that sort of thing. So I would probably tend to buy from your site because the sor- the support would be there, right? I could actually call you or contact you in some way. We've got, yeah, we do. We we have a really comprehensive troubleshooting library of of resources in terms of installation and troubleshooting some of the problems that pop up and tutorials and things that that are going to be very specific whereas Amazon necessarily wouldn't be able to obviously have those kind of resources. Right. So here's a question. Um, Do you actually recommend people who have their own products, for example, do you recommend they actually post their items on Amazon? Yeah, good question. I think it depends on, I think it depends on if, 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 if the product is if it's your product and you've created it and it's branded to you, I think Amazon is a very powerful platform because you get to leverage all of their traffic and all of their reputation and trust and authority. Um, I think if you're reselling existing products, or I think that's tough. I mean, I know in our niche, we've got people who are starting to go on Amazon and, and resell uh, products. And we have intentionally stayed out of that market because 
even assuming we could get in and assuming we could make a little bit of profit out of the gates, it just becomes a price war. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, I've, there have been people in the forums, in the e-commerce field forums, who have been selling on Amazon for a while, and they just talk about how people, they'll get on there and they'll see people selling below cost. And they don't understand if it's because they're just trying to gain market share or improve their seller reputation and their rank in Amazon by increasing their volume, or if they're just clueless and they don't understand that they're losing money. But I think it's, I don't think it's a good long-term strategy for building a profitable income stream. I think there might be a few couple anomalies uh, where maybe arbitrage opportunities where you can get in and maybe for you know a couple months here or there, maybe even a year you can get in and and make it work. But I think selling existing products on Amazon is is going to be tough. Hmm. And so let's say you were to decide to sell on Amazon, would you go with the uh, just selling on Amazon regular or would you actually use their fulfilled by service? Because Amazon Prime is very compelling. It is. And I think, you know, I, I think using the FBA approach if you're selling on Amazon makes a lot of sense. Because like you said, you get you know, it's it's going to pop up. It'll qualify for, at a minimum, free shipping above, you know, 25 or $35 for folks. Uh, and then also, if it's for Prime members, uh, yeah, they get it shipped for, you know, two days uh, two days for free, which is, you know, I I know that I have been sh- trying recently to to go less on Amazon, especially for unique products, trying mm-hmm. to support independent mer- merchants more. But there's some things that just are commodities that, that Amazon is, I think, is a great, you know, is, is a good choice for uh and like diapers, for example, you know, we buy diapers on Amazon, and and I know that when I'm shopping for for a commodity on Amazon, I always click that little Amazon Prime button. Yeah, absolutely, same yeah. here. And in fact, whenever I shop on Amazon, I always look for the Prime. Uh, I actually don't buy from anyone who doesn't have the Prime displayed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's powerful. It is. It's very powerful, and so that that actually presents unique challenges. Um, you know, when you're trying to decide whether you want to sell in there, because they take a huge chunk out of fulfilled by, I think it's like almost a third of your revenue is just lopped off right off the bat. Are, are you sure? That seems uh, really rich. I just had someone else on the show actually who sells on Amazon using fulfilled by for a living. And uh, she said, yeah, she, she dedicates a third of her revenue to pay Amazon and she gets a third to buy the product and then she gets to keep a third. Wow. That's, so that's the I and again I'm I'm sure she has she's in a position to speak much more authoritatively than I am on it because I haven't used them. But I always thought it was, you know, about roughly fifteen percent for just the listing fee through Amazon. And then I always thought FBA was more of a fee based if you use FBA, I always thought it was a fee based thing that was just pretty much like you pay a, a you know a dollar for every pick and then you pay a shipping fee and, and that's it. Yeah, I'm not sure on the specifics. She tends to smel- sell uh, smaller items, but that's how she kind of budgets her uh, okay. her stuff. But, you know, I think just regularly selling on Amazon, I think the fees are on the order of 12 and 13%. I, I have to check to make sure since I don't sell on Amazon, but I think that's what the percentages were. Uh, ballpark. Yeah. yeah, I think it varies by category. So like books yeah. versus electronics versus other things. But I remember looking at electronics and they were like 15%. So if we were going to try to sell trolling motors online... Like uh, eats, you know, at least in the margins. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just wipes out your entire margin right there. Yeah. So if your um, right channel radios, if your margins were a little higher, I don't know what they are, but if they were a little higher, would you consider selling on Amazon or would you just stay away? Again, we we'd stay away. The only thing I would consider selling on Amazon is something we could add some kind of value to, because again, we'll just we'll just get, even if it's not today, in the next you know three six months. More people are going to come in and just drive that price down to zero, and you've got you know there's a decent amount of time you got to invest in, not a crazy amount, but you got to get in, set it up, and and get your listings going. And so the only thing I would sell is maybe some of our packages that we bundled together and included, uh, you know that that very in depth uh, personal video that walks through the highlight, and in, in, uh, and also included that installation guide more valuably that that walks through the process because then you've got some kind of differentiator, some kind of value add where mm-hmm. you. You've got you've got a reason to be able to to charge a different price, and it sets it apart so people can't compare apples to apples. But oh man, I, it's yeah, I'm not interested in, in getting in and slugging it out with with 20 people who uh, who are willing to you know right. have a, have a fraction of a fraction of a percentage profit margin on Amazon. Yeah, you know, speaking of which, I, I had considered this strategy with my store since we sell products that are. Uh, many of which are pretty unique. We were thinking about just posting stuff on Amazon at higher prices to to cover the fees. And then, you know, if someone buys, we can kind of just 
in in the uh, packaging provide a lot of collateral about our store and hopefully the second time they'll actually come directly to our store like we can incentivize them with a coupon or something like that it's tough i i've heard that and again this is me speaking a little bit out of my authority zone but i've heard that amazon has restrictions on how you can brand and what you can include in your product when you're selling on their marketplace i think Ah, yeah if you use if you use fulfilled by amazon as your fulfillment center and you don't sell on Amazon's marketplace. So let's say you use their fulfillment center, but you sell on your own, you know, bumblebeelinens.com, but you use FBA to ship it out. I think those restrictions are lifted. But if you have any of your Bumblebee Linens products listed on the Amazon marketplace where people place the order through Amazon, Mm -hmm. I think they're real anal about you including branding and marketing material. I don't think they let you do it. And I actually think you have to pay, they ship everything out in an Amazon branded box and uh-huh. if you want them to ship out in a box that is not branded with Amazon, just a blank one, you have to pay extra for that. Oh. So they're very conscious of using their fulfillment services and using, uh, I guess, using their fulfillment services to brand Amazon as well as not necessarily allowing merchants to use uh, use their platform to really siphon people over to their own brand. I think that's tricky. Very clever on their part. It very is. clever. Well played, Amazon. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you read the? Uh, Do you read the Everything Store by chance? It's, it's. I have not. Yeah, you should read it. It's interesting. It's. Uh, I would recommend it to anyone listening. Um, it, it just kind of the biography of, uh, of Amazon of Jeff Bezos. Uh, it's 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 a good read. It's it's very telling. So. <laughs> so we're cu- coming up uh, onto uh, forty minutes now. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I I wanted to just ask you. If you had any advice for people who are listening who want to create an online store who maybe want to dabble in drop shipping or carrying inventory and that sort of thing. Yeah, I'd say I'd say if you're going to start with drop shipping, try to make sure that you have an ability to grow beyond that into stocking your own product. That's one of the kind of the regrets I have about CB radios and, and that, that niche is even as we've grown, just the economics of buying the product and bringing them in house really doesn't make sense, you know. The, so the increased margin we would get as we bought products wholesale and brought them in house really doesn't offset the you know the hassle and cost of warehousing them and the capital outlay. Um, and so it, it, it's still a great niche, but I wish we could. I wish the market allowed us to grow into that uh, and invest more money to see higher rewards. So drop shipping again, like we talked about, it's got some great advantages, but make sure you've got a long term plan that'll let you grow past that. I mean, for me personally, the next business I start uh, will likely, I'd, ideally, I'd like to start building, creating my own products. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, at a minimum, stocking products that are harder to get, uh, but ideally creating a unique product and or a brand um, that's not available other places, just for all the reasons that, that we mentioned, because it's so much easier to scale when you've got those higher margins. You can use paid advertising. You're differentiated. You can leverage Amazon versus having to wade into the muck and compete with people on tiny you know, profit margins. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that would be my advice is don't you know, really think through it. If you've got the capital to invest, uh, if, you've got, uh, if you're willing to take a little bit more of a longer approach to seeing returns, um, creating your own product uh, or stocking products at a minimum uh, is, is going to give you uh, those higher uh, those higher returns in the long run. And if you do start with drop shipping, make sure you do have uh, one a plan to really understand how you're going to differentiate yourself. If it's price, if the only way you're going to be different from other folks is price, don't get into that market. You really need a very concrete, actionable plan on how you're going to add value to existing products. And then, secondly, make sure you've got you know, talk with your suppliers ahead of time, talk with manufacturers and say, hey, what's the margin increase I get if I buy direct from the manufacturer in bulk versus buying from a wholesaler? If it's only 2 or 3 or 4%, ugh, that's tough. If it mm. doubles or triples your margin, that's a much more attractive growth trajectory as you uh, increase your revenues. Yeah, and then one thing I just want to add to that, is speaking of adding value, one thing I noticed that, uh, you know, in terms of personalized products, Amazon doesn't really do a, a, a really good job of doing that. So if you can add value by personalizing, which is becoming kind of huge these days, that will help a lot with your shop as well. I don't know if that applies to a lot of things, but. No, I think it's a know. great point. Yeah, anything, people love personalized stuff. And uh, yeah, it's you're right, that's not something, I don't think. I'm not sure I've ever seen anything that you can get personalized on Amazon. I don't think they have the interface to do it right now. I'm sure they have something in the works, though. But for now, at least. You know. Yeah, yeah, it's man. Yeah, we're gonna knock on. <laughs> we'll give, give them three months, and they'll have it rolled out. <laughs> 
So I thought I'd end this uh, interview. Um, you already mentioned one business book that you recommend that we all read, uh, which is Sell Anything or Sell Everything. Uh, is there any other business books that have kind of shaped the way you look at, look at business and running stores? Yeah. Oh, you mean, do you mean the uh, the Everything Store? Is yeah, the cool? Everything Store. Sorry. Yeah, I got the title wrong. Oh, that's all right. Everything Store. I'd say yeah, a couple books. A couple of books I've read recently that that uh, really enjoyed. One was uh, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and okay. and uh, that's kind of a classic. And I always, I don't know about you, Steve, but I'm always a little bit leery of these self help books with like these really inspirational kind of feel good feel goody titles <laughs> like that. And I was like, really, like how much you know, how impactful is this going to be? But I read it, and I was I was really impressed. Um, it actually has changed the way. Uh, I've kind of looked at business. It's it's made me be more intentional about what I spend my time on, how I structure my day. Um, so that is a book that I would I would recommend. Again, the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Great book. Another book if you're managing people uh, is Entree Leadership by Dave Ramsey. He really talks about you know how you how you structure your businesses, how you build a team, how you lead with uh, intentionality and with integrity and in a way that that is going to inspire confidence and loyalty with with your team members. Um, so that's going to be something maybe a little bit more for folks who if they do have a team uh, or aspire to have a team in the future. Uh, but it's a great book. Again, it was Entree Leadership by Dave Ramsey. So those are two recently that that uh, have, have been impactful for me. Okay. Yeah, I have not read the Dave Ramsey book yet. I'll have to go and pick it up and check it out. Yeah, that's yeah. great. What about you? What did you uh, read any books recently that have, have had a big impact? Yeah, you know, I get asked this question all the time. And right now I've been reading a lot of technical books because I'm just trying to learn all the tech behind websites uh, and become more proficient at it so that, in fact, uh, I can contract out the work a little more effectively so I can kind of understand what the developers are doing to help me out uh, and that sort of thing. So I like to understand everything before I contract anything out. So that's yeah. just in my personality. I think I think it's yeah. I think it's a great. I mean, like we were kind of talking about this offline before we started the interview, but I just wrote a post on bootstrapping, and I think that's, I think it's one of the big mistakes people make is not having a uh, understanding about different areas of their business before they go out and hire it, because I just more often than not it just leads to chaos. I agree, and just like this podcast, so I, I learned how to post process all the audio, and then. Maybe I'll be using your guy to do all the post-processing after this. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I'd like to close, you know, any other online services that you use for your businesses that you can't live without? That's a good question. Um, use Google Docs really for all our processes that we that we set up in our documentation. Use Asana um, for, for setting up, uh, you know, who's responsible for what, not only for for kind of project tracking, but for managing SOPs and things like that and responsibilities. Um, other services, uh, those are, I mean, those are a couple of the big ones that we, okay. apart from hosting and help desk and stuff, but I think a lot of those people are probably familiar with. So, okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, to close, do you want to tell everyone how they can find you and what all the other sites that you own are? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, you can find me, depending on where you're at, over at Twitter, at Udarian, Y-O-U-D-E-R-I-A-N, or at Ecommerce Fuel. Um, of course, ecommercefuel.com is is where I blog about e-commerce uh, and uh, um, also have a private community. If you're a store owner and you've got you know established store owner with at least you know four or five thousand in monthly revenue, or an e-commerce professional with uh, you know at least a year of experience in the space, that's the form uh, that we run for those uh, the vetted form for those groups of people over there. Um, and also have a podcast that as well uh, that you can you can learn more about on iTunes or at ecommercefuel.com. And again, it's just the name of the podcast is e-commerce fuel. So that's uh, you know that and the right channel radios.com is the radio business we've been talking about, and then trollingmotors.net, no longer mine. Uh, it's in good good new hands, uh, but uh, that's the business we just sold. So I think uh, that's that's kind of what I've got going on online. Great, and uh, I just thought I'd put in a plug for your forms as well. Uh, the amount of people, the quality of the people on that forum is, is very high. And I've actually personally learned a lot myself. So, well, well, thanks. It's been good having you in and it's been, uh, it's been fun growing the community and just, it's cool having a group like that of people who are in the trenches that we can kind of bounce stuff off, off of each other. And you know that everyone at least not to be, ex you know, to be hoity toity and, and exclude people for the sake of excluding people. But I think they're, you know, it's there's something to be said for having people that all are in the same place uh, in terms of maintaining a co level of conversation that you know everyone is kind of uh, able to plug into relatively quickly. Yeah, I don't know about you, Andrew, but I get lonely 
because I don't know a whole lot of people that run e-commerce stores. So it's a good outlet for me, at least. Yeah, no, I, uh, I think I think all of us as humans do. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Andrew. Really pre- appreciate your time. Hey, thanks for having me, Steve. It's been good chatting. <laughs> all right. Take care. I always love chatting with Andrew Udarian. Now, what I really like about him is that he's really down to earth, extremely personable, and always willing to help. He's also created an incredible e-commerce community on his forums, so I recommend that you go check them out at www.ecommercefuel.com slash e-commerce dash forum. So be sure to check out the show notes for this episode where you'll find the sites and the links mentioned in this episode. Also, if you have a minute, it would really help if you could subscribe and leave a review on iTunes for this podcast. Also, don't forget to enter my free podcast giveaway where I'm actually giving away a lifetime membership for my profitable online store course. So more, for more information about this giveaway, go to www.mywifequitherjob.com slash podcast dash launch. Once again, that's mywifequitherjob.com slash podcast dash launch. Thanks for listening.